Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Davina Lloyd and I'm the chair of the steering committee of the CEDAW People's Tribunal. And with me today is Dr. Megan Campbell. Uh, Dr. Campbell is a senior uh, lecturer in law at Birmingham University Law School, but she's also the deputy director of the Oxford Human Rights Hub. And I'd like to start by welcoming you, Megan, and asking you how you got involved in working in human rights and in particular in women's rights. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on uh, today. My journey into women's rights in CEDA started in law school. Uh, I had some really great, fantastic law professors at the University of Manitoba in Canada, where I'm from. And we were taught and we got to learn to talk about uh, women's rights and equality. And there was a very famous case called Goslin in Quebec, where the Quebec government uh, cut benefits for people under 30 to essentially below the poverty line. And it the case was unsuccessful, the, the woman lost. And I remember thinking this was so wrong. Canada is a very wealthy country. It seems inherent in our idea of equality that you should not be cutting someone's benefits to where they are forced into you know, severe poverty. But there, there's something, something sort of morally reprehensible about that and, and what, what can law do to address that? Particularly, uh, what can the right to equality bring when we think that and see that economic inequalities tend to cluster on certain identity characteristics that we think of in terms of equality, like race and gender, migration, disability, uh, religious minorities, sexual orientation. When we see these sort of patterns emerging, we sort of think maybe there's some connection between income inequality and status inequality. And how can discrimination law, equality law, be used to address those synergies? And that, that was kind of how I got into it. And then I was very fortunate to have a great supervisor for my doctoral uh, project. And she kind of pushed me into looking closely at, at the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. And that's sort of where I've uh, made my intellectual home for the past number of years. And, and that's where you, you published a book fairly recently exactly on those issues about women and poverty, equality, and how CEDAW can actually have a role in addressing those issues. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your work uh, with that book and, and what your conclusions were from that. Yeah, so uh, we can see that women are disproportionately suffering from poverty around the world. So that tells us that something about gender power relations between men and women is at stake in explaining women's poverty. And the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, has lots of provisions about women's equality. Its, ma its main aim is to achieve women's equality. But surprisingly, there are no real provisions on women's poverty in, in the text. There's no right to be free from poverty uh, for women. There are rights in education and employment and uh, political participation, but there's nothing about women's poverty, which is a huge obstacle to their equality. And so my book looks at how can we look at the rights that exist within CEDAW and how can we reinterpret them, re-understand them, so that they're actually directed towards this big obstacle to women's equality, poverty. So it tries to understand how a right to equality can be used to further women's both status equality in terms of their gender and economic equality in terms of income and material um, disadvantage. And so the conclusion is that the text can do that, that the right to equality is, is so multifaceted, multidimensional in CEDAW and can be targeted and directed towards many, many obstacles to women's human rights. And it can be directed towards how poverty acts as an obstacle to their right. And it gives a sort of rich interpretation of the text of the treaty and points forward about how the, the committee that monitors the implementation of CEDAW, how it can use this interpretation in its advocacy and its monitoring role to prompt states to use the right to equality to address women's poverty. And so looking at the UK in particular and the current work that we're doing with the CEDAW People's Tribunal uh, to try and get the conventions from the CEDAW incorporated into domestic law, how do you think this would have affected the lives of, of girls and women in the United Kingdom if we had gone ahead and incorporated CEDAW when it first came out in 1979, over 40 years ago? What do you think would have been the benefits? for girls and women in this country? It's, a, it's an interesting question because it's a bit like a counterfactual historical question, like what would have happened? And there was such amazing advocacy done by so many women's uh, groups, activists, lawyers, politicians about bringing in legislation in the UK, like the Sex Discrimination Act, the Domesticating the Human Rights Act, 
that their advocacy would have been strengthened easier, easier might be a bit of an overclaim, but would have been strengthened by having CEDAW as a tool in their in their activism. Like, look, we have these rights also within our domestic sphere, these rights about uh, political participation, these rights about equal pay. And the other sort of, probably the biggest thing that the CEDAW, if CEDAW had been fully domesticated into UK law, would have been around socioeconomic rights. Much of the UK architecture on the protection of rights is focused on a certain type of right, particularly civil and political rights, the so rights to free speech, rights to a fair trial, right to freedom of association, but significantly less protection for rights to education, rights to health care, that are really important for women's equality, for, uh, for many types of equalities, and for, for many, many people, rights to education and health care are very, very important. And if CEDAW had been domesticated back in the nine, uh, 40 years ago, this would have domesticated these socioeconomic rights, which are currently uh, not as well protected in the UK as the civil and political rights. So it would have broadened the scope of rights protection for women. Yeah, and it's very much the case, as we have seen in the UK with austerity and the work of Professor Alston in particular, that 85% of austerity measures impacted uh, on women and impacted in a bad way on women. And women have been the brunt of all the um, austerity measures, the financial measures, and um, this has put them in a very, very bad case, whatever their age, but particularly, of course, uh, with the women born in the 1950s because of their pensions issue. Um, what I'd like to, to say, uh, Megan, is um, it's probably not breaking news now because people will have looked at the website, but you are helping us on our advocacy team for the CEDAW People's Tribunal, for which we are very grateful. Um, and it's an amazing team that I have the privilege to work with. So I thank you very much in advance for all the work you're going to be doing to try to make sure that we actually get CEDAW incorporated into UK law and make the future different from the past. So thank you very much for your time today, Megan. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be part of the team. I think CEDAW is a great treaty and the more people know about it and are aware about it, uh, I think the world will be a more equal place for not just women, but for all people. Thank you very much. My pleasure.